Welcome to Broad Ideas. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hi. Okay, first of all, I want to say, our guest today, Liza Soberano, she's in the new movie. Oh my God, I can't talk. Are you drunk? <laughs> I feel like I am. She's in the new movie, Lisa Frankenstein, who it was written by Diablo Cody uh, and directed by Zelda Williams, who this is her directorial debut. That's Robin Williams' daughter. Did you know this, Rob? No. This is a very a female-led movie, which I love. Love. And I just wanted to say that. <laughs> I love it. I do too. Liza is wonderful in this film. It's her first Hollywood film. Um, yeah. And she just really did an amazing job. A really fun movie. Liza is lovely. Amazing in the film. Yeah. Let's get to her so we stop talking. <laughs> You look so, you look so beautiful. Pretty. I love your outfit. You. We're so happy you're here. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> you're so beautiful. And even like I can tell your inside is just… Absolutely. Shining. Thank stunning. Thank you. I get so shy. Oh, you do. You're so sweet. It's just amazing. It's actually such a… Like, I love being wrong. That's mm-hmm. like something I love. And like just getting to know you through watching the film and also like your Instagram and all these pictures… I would think that you would be in intimidating. Really? Wouldn't you? Yeah. Like like a powerhouse. Just like <laughs> just like a diva. A, just fierce, you know? <laughs> yeah. But you're the most like tender, oh, precious. You can you. feel that you're a really I'm really a shy girl. <laughs> Aww. But thank you. I'm I'm so flattered. Like I, I'm really excited to be here today. And I I was telling you earlier, I've listened to a few of the podcasts, so I'm kind of fangirling right now. <laughs> oh my Yay! gosh, that's so sweet thank that you, you listened. That means so much. Um, thank you. But you know, just even like like reading about you and like learning about you, just your upbringing and where you came from and all of that is so interesting to us. Uh, for many reasons, but did you grow up in Visalia? Yes. So I was actually born in Santa Clara, like the Bay Area. And then I moved to Visalia when I was around four or five. Yeah. And then I eventually ended up migrating to the Philippines when I was 10. So Oh, got it. I've lived in the Philippines a lot longer than America, but I did start here. Okay. Because my stepdad's family is from Visalia and you don't hear it often. So I saw that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. Whenever yeah. I mention Visalia, people are like, where's that? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, it's central. right smack in the center of California. Yes, very central California. Yeah, <laughs> when we saw that, we're like, Visalia <laughs> of all places. Yeah. yeah. So then you did that and you went to the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And when did acting, everything, when did it all start? Um, It all started when I was 12, actually. So I started by modeling first, but that only went on for like six months. I wasn't very successful at it, I would say. (laughs) I mean, I find that Um, hard. (laughs) And then I started like auditioning for um, some acting um, bits. And I didn't initially want to become an actress. It was kind of something that was just presented to me. And um, I grabbed the opportunity coming from a place of like need. Mm -hmm. Um, And then... The rest is history. I just started working. Yeah. <laughs> Full time. Yeah. But you were you were doing other things in the Philippines and you mentioned yes. us before you had your own podcast. Yes, I did. So that actually started around the pandemic. Um I right before the pandemic, I started kind of struggling with my own mental health. Mm. Um, and that was coming from like just years of um focusing on work and not really getting to, I guess, fully be present in my um, childhood and like maturing process and everything. And so, um, I was dealing with a lot of things mentally. And then I came across this, um, company called Mind You in the Philippines. And they're the first, um, I would say mental health service company in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And, um, unlike here in the States, we're very, I would say behind just in terms of like, really understanding mental health and mental health issues and um, having like different um, areas to go to when you're struggling. And so um, I started, I partnered with that company and then I came out with a podcast in hopes of making it just more mainstream for people because in the Philippines, yeah, we don't really like to talk about mental health that much. Why do you think that is? It's a taboo topic because... Um, I think, honestly, it dates 
all the way back to like being colonized because we were colonized for so long. And um, we have this like Filipino saying called like utang na loob, which means like you're forever in debt to um, just be grateful for whatever it is that you have. And Filipinos always like to say we're so resilient when it comes to facing challenges and whatever. But it's actually like we're just people pleasers. We don't, <laughs> yeah, we don't mm-hmm. like, um, we don't like complaining. We don't like talking about our hardships or anything. Everything has to be happy and pleasant at all times. And that's just not the way the world works. Obviously, we try our best to be happy at all times. But um, in the Philippines, I think it's kind of a facade sometimes. Mm. Like, you don't want to talk about the bad. It just has to be perfect all the time. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you started talking about it, mm-hmm. how was it received? I think a lot of people started really opening up about their own struggles. Mm-hmm. And it started becoming less of a taboo topic, I would yeah. say. Like people started um, being a little bit more vocal on social media. Um, I got a lot of messages from my fans saying that it really help them to think that like searching for professional help isn't isn't so bad isn't embarrassing um and i got to meet a lot of cool people while on um uh, while doing the podcast i had a lot of different guests from different walks of life i had a politician i had actors i had business people businessmen and um yeah it was just it was so interesting to see like how all these different like successful people kind of m- m- manage and deal with their stress and whatever issues are going on with their lives. And more than anything, I think I learned the most. Yeah, <laughs> I, hope a lot of yeah. people, I hope a lot of people learned by watching the podcast, but I think I learned, I took home the most. And what did you do for yourself during that time? So what did that look like for you as far as, because I think that mental health is a very broad mm-hmm topic. It is. Right. But what did it look like for you? How did Mm -hmm. you experience that? Um, mine came from a place of like, not knowing actually who to talk to. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that was my major struggle because I started working at such a young age and people pleasing at such a young age. Whenever I would go through something, um, I would always feel hesitant to share like how I, actually feel. I, I felt hesitant to be honest. Um, and so um, for me, when I started doing the the podcast, it was more of me trying to like regain my own confidence in a way or like um, security and like just feeling okay to feel bad about a certain thing yeah. or to be honest about the way I feel about certain things. And it's something I still honestly struggle with mm-hmm. till now. Um, and I'm constantly, like, I feel like there's something pulling me back whenever I'm answering questions, even in interviews, honestly, because um, just being in the public light so much, I feel like every little thing I say gets torn apart yeah. um, and gets interpreted in different ways. And so, like, I get I get very self-conscious. Mm-hmm. And so when I started becoming more vocal about mental health, my goal or my promise to myself was just to always be authentic and honest. Um, So that's where it kind of started. But I've always also been fascinated with psychology itself. And so I went to college for a year. That's amazing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I took uh, up—I'm taking psychology, but I had to stop, unfortunately, because work got busy again. Um, But my ultimate goal really is to make um, mental health services more accessible in the Philippines and um, be able to provide to people that are less fortunate to be able to pay for these types of services. Yeah, I mean, I think it's such a beautiful thing. And I think, especially since the pandemic and everything else, it's been, I think people are more vocal and and I think it's amazing. Mm-hmm. But um, what you're doing mm-hmm. is incredible. And I Thank think you. just in using your voice because you have one and, and using it for something like that is very... Thank you so much. Yes. And you know what I'm hearing and what you're saying that I think is for me the most important, what lands the most is I think that the biggest source of comfort that we can offer people is for them not to feel alone. Yes. And that what they're going through isn't unique, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. no matter what it is, even yeah. if it is unique, yeah. that there's someone else out there that has felt the anxiety or depression yeah. or even, you know, when it comes to suicidal ideation and mm-hmm. all of these things that are such 
epidemics mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that it takes people saying like, I know how you feel and these are the things that I do to deal with that versus I've got it all together yeah. and life is perfect and I'm, you know, killing it. Yeah. And all that does is make people feel worse. Mm-hmm. You know what's so interesting as we're talking about this? I'm thinking about your movie, Lisa's Frankenstein, and your character, mm-hmm. how, you know, you expect like, the stepsister to be like the, the evil, bitch, yeah. the evil, yeah. but the like how girl. supportive mm-hmm. with clearly, mm-hmm. you know, Lisa's character is dealing with like her own mental health stuff and everything and how exactly. your character was so supportive. Mm-hmm. And it's so beautiful how it's kind of paralleled to, to who I am yes. as well. Actually, that's what the director was saying, Zelda Williams. Um, yeah. She said that she felt like I was perfect for the role because um, she had a lot of different people kind of read um, for the character. And eventually she was saying that everybody kind of read it too mean or too like pretentious. And she said that like when I came in, I just had a very fresh take on it. I was very earnest, earnest. and sweet. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 And um, when I read it, I thought, Right away, that's what the director was looking for because just like going through the whole script and everything, I realized that Taffy is actually Lisa's only true supporter, like someone who is always there to champion her and push her to become her most confident self. Mm -hmm. And um, I really love that about Taffy and I really love how she's kind of like breaking that stereotype. Yeah. Love that. Love it. And it, yeah. Yeah, like even, I don't know if I'm allowed to say some of the lines, but like (laughs) even some of the lines where she's like, she could do pageants if she had, but like, I feel like 90% of people probably came in Mm -hmm. and mean girls did. Yeah. Because it's the obvious. Because it's the obvious choice of like, she could be so good if only she had. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you were just so truthful. Like she would, she could do that. Yeah. She could absolutely do it. (laughs) It's funny because Taffy, sometimes she slips here and there where where she says some pretty questionable things, (laughs) but you know, that's coming from a place of like, she grew up with her mom, Janet, and Janet is very opinionated and, and, you know, she is who she is. So, um, it slips out here and there, but it's not, it still doesn't come from a place that isn't genuine or doesn't mean well, you know what I mean? Right. And your mom in that film is an icon. I'm obsessed with her. I I really am. I'm like, if, if anyone were to ask me like, who would you want to be like? She's like my goal. Really? I love her her. so much. I'm so obsessed with her too. Okay, good. (laughs) When I met her, um, I was just holding everything in me to not, like, freak out and fangirl (laughs) over her. But, like, I grew up watching so many of her films. And I think she's such an amazing actor. And there were so many times where, like, she would be filming and I wasn't in the scene with them. So I would just observe from, like, the behind the scenes. and. I was just so amazed by her acting skills. Like, she does it so naturally, but also, like, she really embodies every character that she she gets. So mm-hmm. She does, and her choices are always so unique and they different. Are. And that's the thing is that that whole movie, to mm-hmm. me, was a bunch of opposite choices. Yeah. And I was like, woo, this is refreshing, <laughs> right? Like, none of it was on the nose. Yes. Except for the things that were supposed to be. Yeah. That were yeah. being commented to us. Yeah. It reminded me of film. I grew up watching. Like, mm-hmm. it really felt like Heather's. I was going to say, you're yeah, going to say Which Heathers. was my favorite movie of all times. <laughs> but it stylistically and the tone, and it was just, it was amazing. Was this Zelda's first? Yeah, this, this is her, her direct debut, debut film. Yeah, direct she killed debut. it. I thought so. She did amazing. Yeah. yeah. So cool. I'm so happy for her because she's such an amazing, sweet person. And she's so talented and so quirky and so special. And I think, like, she she really deserves everything that she's getting right now, like all the praises and everything mm-hmm. from the film. And I'm just so excited because she just truly and genuinely loved the script and the film. And she really enjoyed the process of making it. Mm-hmm. And honestly, this is like the most fun I've ever personally had on a set. Oh, yeah. And um, Cole actually had a conversation with me on our last day. And I was like why does this feel so special? I'm like, Hmm. is this because it's my first Hollywood film? And he was like, you know, I've been doing this since I I was six months old. And yeah, he was like, legit. It's not like this. He was like, "You're this is actually a very special film," Aww. and that I was, I, yeah, I got the chills too when he said that because 
Um, I was just hoping that my first experience out of the Philippines would be something that I would really enjoy and like carry with me forever. And I can definitely say this film has made me fall in love with acting even more. Yeah. I just really genuinely enjoyed everyone on the set and everyone, how everyone had like so much to contribute and how everybody was just genuinely in love with the story and yeah. wanted to put their best foot forward. But what a fun, I mean, fun. I say fun mm-hmm. and there's like people you know, mm-hmm. being killed and <laughs> things being chopped off. <laughs> They're being that killed. That was still pretty fun. <laughs> in a very fun way. In a yeah. very fun, we'll <laughs> say in a very fun way. But yeah, yeah. it's just like such a cool, mm-hmm. yeah. I can imagine like that experience. And how yeah. how awesome for your first experience here, yeah. like in uh, quote unquote Hollywood, whatever, mm-hmm. having that. And yeah. with those people and Diablo Code, like mm-hmm. wrote it and stuff. So, I mean, it's yeah. just. And they're all so humble. I was. That's so cool. Like. More than anything, I was so nervous coming in because I know how, like, successful and established each and every mm-hmm. person is. And Diablo Cody is an Academy Award winner and yeah. everything. And I was expecting them to, like, have a lot of comments about my acting <laughs> or, you know, just the way I am in general because my work ethics may be different from everyone else's. So um, I was just—I was really nervous about that. But everybody was so quick to make me feel comfortable and like I belong there. Aww. And so, yeah, it was definitely the best experience ever. (laughs) You know, that reminds me, like when you were saying that, that they were all humble, something that we talk about a lot that Mm -hmm. comes back to the mental health Mm -hmm. is two things can exist at once. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of times when people are in successful positions, it's harder to admit they're depressed or it's harder to admit Mm -hmm. they have mental health because Mm -hmm. you should be so grateful and Mm -hmm. you should be so, you know, humble Mm -hmm. and all of that. But it's like, you're allowed to be deeply grateful, humble, work hard, all those things and still struggle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that isn't talked about enough. It's like, you should only struggle if life is really hard on you in X, Y, and Z, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So what is that like for you when you are, in one aspect, living a dream? How is it internally? Like, what is that dialogue for you when you do have off days or feeling sad or lonely or whatever it is that you experience? I really love this question, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) It's just, it's because... this pa- these past two years, I made a huge, like, career transition um, coming from the Philippines and becoming, like, a really recognizable face and everything and trying to, like, build a name from, for myself from scratch here in, in America. Um, I got a lot of backlash for s- probably speaking my truth about certain things, the way the industry is in the Philippines and wanting more for myself— not feeling contented and stuff like that, and also struggling with um, societal pressures. And I started talking about that a lot more in the past two years. And um, the reason why I got so much backlash is because before, like I said, I would always just, I would try to be as perfect as possible. I would never talk about anything negative. I would never tell anybody about my hardships. I was actually told not to talk about anything too negative or talk about my real life and my struggles. Um, And that was all in an effort to make me seem like the perfect girl or the dream girl. Um, And, you know, that's not reality. That's not real. Nobody is perfect. Nobody can sustain just being happy, successful, busy, whatever, whatever it is all at once. Like there are going to be days when you don't feel as confident. There are going to be days when you feel like you're not actually successful. There's going to be days where you feel like you're a complete failure. And like, because people only see what's presented to you on social media or in the news or whatever, people kind of think like the moment that you start speaking up about with with anything negative, um, it's like, it's almost like you're being ungrateful or, Mm -hmm. or like you don't even realize what privilege you have. And although I do recognize like the many privileges that I do have and how lucky I am to be in a position of being able to just travel the world and, and live out my dreams, I still do struggle with, you know, ordinary things that everybody else struggles with, insecurities, um, just, not feeling like I'm enough for anyone. Mm -hmm. And um, I get scared to talk about it a lot, especially now, because um, 
when I did start becoming more honest, it's like that's when I started getting more hate. So I feel like Stop. sorry. I know it's so I'm really it's upset so about that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you. No, because yeah, you're giving a gift to yeah. people, you know? Yeah. And so it felt like it almost felt like my most honest self isn't worthy of this love and attention and appreciation from people. And so I kind of I get very self-conscious now when talking about anything because it's like a constant battle between wanting to people please and just wanting to be myself Mm -hmm. and wanting to share my experiences with people in hopes that they'll get inspired or learn a few things. Um, But then, yeah, I always just get torn apart and told that I'm ungrateful, but that's not the truth. Like I, I really mean good by anyone and everything that I do. And I'm just constantly trying to make the world a better place in my own little way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Broad Ideas is supported by Talkspace. Do you think seeing a therapist or psychiatrist would be helpful, but you don't have the time to actually find one and meet with them or afford them? Try Talkspace by doing everything online. Talkspace has made getting the help you want easy, accessible, and affordable. When you've met your therapy goals or simply want to cancel, Talkspace has a simple cancellation process and will work with you to get a prorated refund for unused time if applicable. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with the provider that's right for you, typically within 48 hours. It's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions with your licensed therapist from the comfort of your home. Therapy can help you shift your perspective, find tools to cope in difficult times, and be a guiding light. Talkspace can help with any specific challenges you might be facing. It's the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, substance abuse, relationship issues, and much more. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash ideas. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash ideas to get $80 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash ideas. Broad Ideas is supported by Paired. Okay, so my main relationship is with Olivia and Rob, clearly. Um, (laughs) And Paired has actually (laughs) brought up some really funny topics, quizzes, things for us to do with each other that we've been adding in our posts sometimes. Olivia brought up this burnt toast theory. Anyways, it was prompted by Paired. We've been having so much fun with it. We love playing games. We've done it on the podcast before. And this has made it so much more fun because it's given us new ideas. I feel like we've run every other game into the ground because we're such gamers, not the video kind. We're having so much fun with Paired. It's simple and often hilarious. Each day you get a quiz to play or question to answer, and you cannot see your partner's answer until you answer yourself. Whether you are just a few dates in or have been together a long time, it's time to lighten the mood and have fun with your partner by using Paired. Head to Paired.com slash ideas to get a seven-day free trial and 25% off if you sign up for a subscription. Just head to P-A-I-R-E-D.com slash ideas to sign up today. Connect with your partner every day using Paired. A happier relationship starts here. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know, a person like yourself with who has the 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 reach and and the platform to do these things. But it is hard when you put things out there that are vulnerable or insecure or whatever they may be. They're just honest, mm-hmm. and to have any feedback that you, know, yeah, everyone is has their challenges and their own personal internal struggles and whatever. So I think. I was wondering, do you actually, do you guys get that a lot? Because you guys talk a lot about like (laughs) personal struggles, mental health and everything, all these like very um, heavy topics. Mm. Do you guys get a lot of backlash too? (laughs) And what is is that like? (laughs) Because I just want to know what it's like here in America. It's funny because like we, I, I mean, I definitely have had my share of it and then I can catch, I catch myself like Trying, I filter myself more sometimes, mm-hmm. like especially here, and I'm like, oh god, like mm-hmm. I said that, and this, I'm such a people pleaser too. Mm-hmm. Like I really suffer from that. So, all of that recovering people pleaser. <laughs> she's a I'm in recovery. she's a re, she's in recovery. I'm in recovery. Okay, Although, let's not affirm that. I did it yesterday, so whatever. <laughs> she's like, I did it. You're I'm doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I think you know it's hard because my mom always raised me with this quote. 
It's none of my business what other people think of me. And so I have to constantly mm-hmm. remind myself of mm-hmm. that. It's so hard. Yeah, it is. You know? It It's also like when you're in front of the cameras all the time and when you become someone that is recognized um, amongst many other people, it's like you do want to know what people think about you. You do want to know if you're making certain people proud, if your work is registering well to people. And um, it— I don't know why I have, like, this unhealthy obsession with reading hate tweets about myself. Oh, no. Yeah, like, my new management actually banned me from using Twitter. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Good. Because That's helpful. at a young age, and I didn't know this growing up, I would read hate tweets, and then I thought that I would handle them very well. I was like, I'm not like everyone else. I don't get affected. It's, not, go- it's not going in. It's just funny to me. I was yeah. like, it just comes here and comes out. Comes through here, comes out. And then— um, I realized over time as I got older, what I was actually doing is I would read the hate tweets and little by little, I would change myself for people. And I didn't even recognize that. I didn't know that I was conforming to what other people wanted from me. I thought that I was just improving myself. Right. right. No, it's a tricky line because yeah. we've gone through this. Like when we first started this podcast, I had nothing to do with being out there publicly. Mm-hmm. And when that started, I was getting really mean things that people would say about deep insecurities I had. Mm-hmm. They were touching on things that were actual insecurities, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And so Rachel's like, don't read it. Mm-hmm. So I continued to read it. <laughs> and I would start to extract different things that I found valuable mm-hmm. because some of the things they were saying, I actually had an opportunity to learn from. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. I don't need to mention this every single time. I yeah. get how that's annoying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, and I can learn from that, right? Mm-hmm. And I felt like if I completely ignore it mm-hmm. and I don't look at all, like, am I blocking myself from learning? Yeah. And so that's the tricky line of like, how do you learn take feedback Mm -hmm. and not let it hurt your feelings when people are just straight up mean Mm -hmm. and ruthless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I don't know yet what's Mm -hmm. more valuable, Mm -hmm. but I do think for me, what I go back to is who am I doing this for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Period. Right. And like just the other night I told Rachel, I got this makes me, Uh -uh. Oh no, it makes me want to cry, but (laughs) I got this, like, DM from someone that was in the hospital. Okay. And she just said, because I talk a lot about having a kid with special needs. Mm -hmm. And she just said, I didn't know who to turn to, Mm -hmm. but I had heard you talk to your son. Mm -hmm. And I just, we just got diagnosed Mm -hmm. with this thing. And Mm -hmm. knowing I had you to reach out to, even though I don't know you, Mm -hmm. brought me peace in the hospital. And I'm like, Okay, that's who I'm doing this for. It's not the guy that's like, I hate Olivia's voice. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, still hung exactly. up on that one. <laughs> but, but that, you know, but that's not who we're doing it for. Mm-hmm. And so to me, I feel like that's the most valuable part if you go to psychology. It's like, what is my intention behind my work? Yeah. And like, am I doing it to be loved or am I doing it to affect change? Because you can't do both at the same time. Mm-hmm. I really love what you just said. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta remember that one. Yeah, right. Because yeah. that's what they say: the stars reflect light. And so it's like if you're reflecting what's true, what's honest, mm-hmm. what's light, what's valuable, like that's gonna reflect in other people's lives, mm-hmm. and that's probably who you're doing it for. Yeah, for yeah. Right? sure. Yeah, because like I started also at a really young age where I didn't know what or who I was doing it for. Like I said earlier, it was coming from a place of need where I just, I don't know why at a young age, I was like, I want to help out my family financially. Um, (laughs) And so I was doing it for them. But then as you get older, it becomes less and less about that. You get so caught up in the hustle and bustle of life and um, you get so caught up in wanting to succeed. And then you kind of forget along the way who or what it is that you exactly that you're doing all of this for. And Mm -hmm. that's actually where my mental health problems started coming up because I feel like I didn't put a lot of purpose and intention into building this career of mine when I first started because I was a kid, you know. I didn't really know. I was just having fun. I was just having fun, helping out. And then when I started suffering mentally, it was like, I think it was a combination of getting a lot of 
mm, feedback from fans, from industry people. And then also there was this side of me that was like, I'm actually over the industry. I'm after, I'm actually over this career. I'm done. Like, I'm so tired of it already. There's something else I want to do. I want to go to college. I want to pursue a psychology career. And then um, I think along the way, when I did realize that I'm here already, like there's no turning back anymore. I have this platform. People recognize me. What do I do with it? That's right. And then that's when I just, I kind of decided that at all times, I'm just going to be honest and as honest and as authentic as I can be, not only for myself, but for the people watching me. Because whether they like me or not, at least what they're seeing is my most authentic self mm -hmm. and me trying my best to contribute something to society in a positive way. And you said you have how many siblings? I have 10. What? Holy yeah. smoke show. Oh. I have a lot, yeah. Wait, from the same? I have one full brother, okay. and then all of them are half. Got it. But, like, all of them feel like full siblings. Yeah, 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 yeah No, yeah. I have the same, because I have yeah. halves, but they're my siblings. Yeah, yeah. totally. So, um, I always say that I was, like, put on this earth to be an older sister, and I, <laughs> I stand by that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the youngest one is still in my stepmom's stomach, so. Oh, my god! <laughs> I'm 26. Are they so. in the Philippines? So um, I have four siblings in the Philippines, okay. and the rest of them are here in America. Oh, my wow. gosh. Well, I was going to say, because you have so many siblings, and you're the oldest. Yeah. And that's also, like, just goes to, like, you know, an example and, mm -hmm. and how you're— It seems like you take all of that in, mm -hmm. and you take it seriously, and, mm -hmm. and you do want to make an impact. And I do. And like you have so many like siblings yeah. that you're you're emulating that for, mm -hmm. and I think that's so cool. And I wonder if that like also plays into where it stemmed from because I don't know. Did you feel that being the oldest that you kind of had to pave the way? Um, growing up, I didn't really feel like I had to pave the way per se for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. It was more like I was just doing what I wanted, what I had to do because I wanted them. I wanted to give them a life that I didn't grow up having, kind of. Mm -hmm. I didn't think of it too seriously. It was more on a superficial level, I would say. Like, I wanted I wanted all of us to live in one house together. Right. That was my yeah. ultimate dream, actually, at the time. I was like, I'm going to buy a home in America. I'm <laughs> all just going to live there. <laughs> and then as I got older and older, that dream bec started getting further and further away from me. Uh, obviously, like, all my other siblings started getting older, too, started having lives of their own. And that's actually where my mental health issues started, too, because I was oh, like, wow. this was my dream. This was the reason why I started working, and now it's not possible anymore. Like, my full sibling, um, his name is Justin, he has two babies now. So oh, wow. whether I like it or not, he's not going to and live in a house. he's younger than you with yeah. two babies. Yes. Wow. <laughs> it's like, whether I like it or not, he's not going to live in a house with me and the rest of our siblings. <laughs> anymore. Yeah. And then I have a younger sister now who's also a mom. And wow. so it's like, yeah, my dream is no longer possible, but now I have new dreams for all of us. And um, I just, I'm constantly trying to encourage them to just be their best selves. It's also weird because we didn't all grow up together. And my a lot of my siblings that are here in America, they only see what whatever is on social media or whatever. Like we talk from time to time, but they're not seeing what my life is like on a day-to-day -day basis. And I feel like the more and more they see me on social media or in the news, it's like the more and more distant they've become mm, with sense. me. Mm -hmm. And it stems from a place of like, they feel like they're not probably as successful. I've had this conversation with mm -hmm. a few of them. Like they feel like they're not as successful as me or they feel kind of pressured to like live up to the same expectation and I feel really bad, honestly, because that's yeah. not what I was trying to do. Of course not. No. <laughs> yeah, but at times I feel like I've created that distance between us. Yes, and it is also something that triggers a lot of people's material. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, when someone gets successful in any right, mm -hmm. if someone is struggling with their own capabilities mm -hmm. or their own goals and dreams, and when they watch them being realized in other people, oftentimes it triggers their own material. Mm -hmm. And you see this all the time. It's like Jay-Z says. What? <laughs> Quote him. <laughs> he says, uh, the castle got bigger and the circle got smaller. Mm. Right? And yeah. Sometimes she just like throws these things out. I know, that, it's like, so random. And I'm like, 
You know, there's just like stored. But in it's there. true, but it's true. <laughs> it is true. It is and so then true. Uh, dynamics change when you get successful too, and it's like people are starting to think you think you're better mm-hmm. when you're like, no, I was just working. Yeah, or it doesn't mean that I love you less because mm-hmm. you're not doing this. Yeah, right. So I think it's multi layered. Especially in family dynamics. It is. It is. And especially in, I feel like, a broken family dynamic. Because we're all separated, all living our own lives. And despite that, like, I still like to think that we're one big family. But like I said, everyone has their own lives now. And, like, we're all just watching each other from afar. And all we can do is, like, love and support on each other. But sometimes I feel like it's hard for them because we can't relate to each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just like we can't have conversations where it doesn't feel like um, I'm showing off or it doesn't feel like I'm acting like I know more than them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes I try to act like that, though, because You're I'm like, the older sister. I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the older yeah. sister. I'm trying to teach teach you. I'm trying, yeah. to, I'm trying to guide you. And sometimes I feel like they take that kind of wrong. Um, it feels like I feel like I'm better than them. I'm better than everyone else. And that's not it. I, I genuinely love and care for my siblings. So I want the best for them. And I'm just sharing yeah. life and experiences. Yeah, yeah for sure. Mm-hmm. I would imagine that's, yeah, I mean, all of it. Like family dynamics, siblings, there's always so mm-hmm. much. Yeah. <laughs> there's like so much. <laughs> and it's cr- like going back to Lisa Frankenstein too. Yeah. That's the dynamic that Lisa and Taffy has. Because I think Taffy is like the complete opposite of Lisa. Lisa ha- is like kind of an outcast, misunder- yeah. misunderstood, is going through a lot. Um, and she's not really comfortable with opening up about everything that she's dealing with. While Taffy is like just this bubbly, outgoing girl who's super confident. Her only problem is her standing back tuck and everything. <laughs> and like she's constantly trying to be there for Lisa. She wants to be Lisa's sister. She wants to make Lisa feel like she's included in everything. But because Lisa kind of just decided like that Taffy's too good for her or Taffy's right. so different from her, she thinks that Taffy's mean or wrong or whatever. Yes. So exactly. I, that's how I relate to Taffy. <laughs> well, it's, a tr- it's true. That happens so much. Mm-hmm. It happens too with the way people look mm-hmm. even. Just the way they look, people will judge and be like, oh, okay, Mm -hmm. well, that person's this way because they're pretty Mm -hmm. or because they have money. Well, it's it's the same thing like seeing your character in her cheerleading uniform just like quickly like in the trailer. You're Mm -hmm. like, oh, that's like the bitchy stepsister. Like, You you just assume. Yeah. We already have these stereotypes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's so cool. And like you said before, how you played against that. And I think that because you said it was such a special experience, yeah, that definitely— shows on the screen. Mm -hmm. It's like that lightning in a bottle thing. And I remember it was like my first feature I ever did was like the most fun I've ever had on a set. It was the most special thing. And you'll never have something like that per se. There'll be other special experiences. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like you're well aware. You've worked for so long. Um, But just how how special that is. And it it really shows. And I think what made it extra special too is because I'm coming into America kind of as a rookie Mm -hmm. all over again. It's like I'm starting from scratch, but this time I have so much more experience and knowledge of like just how my my job works, how industry, this industry works. And um, um, how I was able to make Lisa Frankenstein like more special for me is like I was fully present and in the moment just Mm -hmm. enjoying it. I wasn't busy thinking about doing a good job. Obviously, I was trying hard. (laughs) I was trying really hard. I wanted to succeed. But more than anything, I was just praying that this would be a great experience for me because I needed that. I needed to fall in love with acting again. Mm, Yeah. Where did you guys shoot it? New Orleans. Oh, Oh, my God. Of course it was like an incredible place. Yeah. Like, what a cool yeah. place. It was such a to funky work. place. Yeah. And it's, it's Zelda and um, Cole's favorite place, apparently, in America. So they had fun kind of touring us around and yeah. showing us, like, some cool, cool spots. We did escape rooms. Fun. fun. Oh, yeah. you guys had fun together. I think that's so awesome. So what, when is the release yeah. date? 
It's on February 9th um, here in America, and I'm really excited because we're doing the the premiere actually on the 5th. So um, that will be my first time watching the movie with like a lot of other people oh and my seeing God, their that's reaction. So fun. That's so awesome. I'm so excited because Zelda said that they've been testing for a while now and everybody loves my character. And I'm just yeah. so excited to actually see and hear that coming from people themselves. Yeah. She's so lovable. She is. She's so <laughs> lovable. From the moment you hit the screen, you're just like, yes to her. Yeah. You truly. Thank you. Yeah, thank I you. I really fell that. in love with the character, too. She's just, she's a sweetheart. Well, you're a sweetheart. Thank you. <laughs> you, you are. Delicious. I want more time with you. I Me wish too. we weren't out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I know, ever. And we're like, yeah, we have so much more We have to so much to. more to cover. But no, but you're going to have huge, to come back. Yes. This is Frankenstein. Super excited about it. Thank excited you. for you. This is amazing. What an awesome you so film much. to do and debut here. Thank <laughs> you. You guys are so easy to talk to. It didn't feel like, oh, how long has this been? 45 minutes. It feels 45 like minutes. it's only been like 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. yeah. You're so easy to talk to. You're so easy to talk to and nice beautiful. And yes. You I guys are too. I can tell we that you, you really are a good person. Yeah. All the Thank success you. and everything that Thank you've you so had much. and will have. And I can't wait for your movie to come out. I'm so excited. You. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for being here. I loved being here. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Broad Ideas is supported by Green Chef. Make this year's resolutions a breeze. Build healthy habits the easy way in 2024 with nutritious recipes from the number one meal kit for clean eating. Green Chef offers unique farm fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins. Savor Green Chef's seasonally inspired recipes where we celebrate the peak ingredients, flavors, and freshness of every season. Choosing Green Chef means choosing real, wholesome foods that don't just fill you up, but also support a healthy lifestyle. It's more than just satisfying hunger. It's about feeling good with every bite. Elevate your everyday wellness with the number one meal kit for clean eating and discover new gut-friendly recipes each week. I love the ease of Green Chef because I'm constantly wanting to put good things into my daughter's body, into my own body, and it's not always easy, but Green Chef has made it so much easier for my little family. Go to greenchef.com slash 60 broad and use code 60 broad to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60 broad and code 60 broad. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. All right. Well, I have something I'd like to talk about. Okay. (sighs) I had a sweet tooth. And Rachel brought in a bowl of candy and she brought in Reese's peanut butter cups and Butterfinger. And I thought, "Mm -mm, it's too soft. I need something with a crunch. And I was just about to eat it. I did eat it. Butterfingers are fairly crunchy. But it's not the crunchy that I was looking for. And when I I put one in my mouth and from the other room, she goes, wait, I'm bringing more. (laughs) And then she brought in the chocolate with the nuts like I would want. And I felt... You know what went through my head? I was like, she loves chocolate nuts. And it's the chocolate fruit she doesn't like. And I have chocolate nuts. So I'm going to bring those in. And you were right. And it made me feel better. (laughs) We spend a lot of time together. (laughs) But it's that crunch. I was Yeah, you needed the nut crunch. And from the other room, she's like, wait, there's more. (laughs) Do you know what I would have eaten from that bowl? The Butterfinger. Butterfinger. The Reese's. The Reese's. (laughs) There's two two options, and you guessed wrong first. Uh, I would go Butterfinger, and I did, actually. Oh, you know what's really cute? What? Is that my mom, because Jeff likes those peanut butter, what are they called? What? Peanut butter cups? Peanut butter cups. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) So she brings them. Every time she comes over, she brings big ones, and she hides them in different places for him. To find for Jeff. Yeah. Wait, but he knows about it, or does he just like discover them randomly and doesn't know where they come from? He knows <laughs> that it's my mom doing it, but and she he'll does open it. like a sock drawer and like she'll you have left them, them, or he'll it. open another thing and she'll yeah. I think that is cute. really cute. I don't think I would like if my mother in law was rummaging through our stuff and putting candy in place. But if she's it was definitely your not favorite rummaging, she's well, just, just going in her in a sock drawer. What do you have in your sock drawer? Yeah, they what's don't up want with you? Lots of stuff in my sock drawers. Mm. Like what? Socks? Socks? Yeah. Like socks. Yeah, no, he's totally comfortable with it. He does. He must love that. He loves it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's something you would do. It is something I would do. I'm like, who could I do that? <laughs> Your people aren't allowed in our bedroom. What? What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean? You're like, you mean you're people, not allowed in my I mean, bedroom? People yeah, what do you come mean? to our house, guests don't come in our bedroom. That's weird. But what about when you redid your house? You would show people what you did. For like a second. No one ever kicks it. And no one just comes no, over no and is like, let's out. go hang out on your bed. No. <laughs> we so, do. Last week. We, <laughs> we were, were all, all on your bed. Yeah. Whole There was five girls? Of us. Five of us? Well, that's different with like girlfriends. Yeah. If it's like in-laws over, they're not coming in our bedroom. <laughs> my <laughs> mom they did in my bed. <laughs> with them. With us. <laughs> <laughs> Not with us. She slept in my bed last night. Well, that's because you slept in the you? kids' rooms. I slept in my bed with my mom and Jeff slept with the kids. Mm. She babysat last night. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My, he does, like, other people put together his drawers. Like, Caitlin knows more about how to organize. She know. knows all the clothes he has more than he does. Yeah, everybody's <laughs> touching his shit. Yeah, my, I like my stuff. No kidding, Not touched. Mr. Itemized Plan <laughs> Organizer. Yeah. I had a little brother that would go in my room and take stuff all the time. So mm, it's it triggering. Sounds a lot of my my space. How do you feel? This is a really genuine question because I've thought this. It gets a little weird. How do you feel about people doing your laundry and touching your underwear? I don't care about mm. that. Our nanny will do it sometimes, and that doesn't make you feel weird. No. Does it make you feel weird? When Jeff's dad like chips in is like folding my underwear, well, that's a gen- like it's that's a little like a, weird. That's a gender you know? thing, though. That's your dad. It's like your father-in-law. Yeah, but also like my brother will do the laundry. I like the way my brother does it because he'll just like leave <laughs> the underwear in like a pile. He doesn't like fold, fold your them. underwear. But I do fold my underwear. You do? You don't? No. You just put them in the drawer. Yeah. Well, because you wear full butt underwear, I could see folding full I butt. I wear both. You do wear both, but like I fold my g-string. Oh, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. You fold yeah. your g-string. You just wear dental floss, so you're just getting that out of the oh container. <laughs> I swear to God, <laughs> you don't fold your underwear. You just shove them in the drawer. Yeah, they're well, they're all g- they're just in a drawer. Yeah, mine are all like in little. Definitely so not. If my dad was here <laughs> doing laundry, he wouldn't it'd be weird if he was folding Natalie's underwear? I but agree. You, <laughs> but you have a woman folding your underwear. She's not, actually. But she'll, like, sometimes move it from the washer to the dryer if she's doing the kids' laundry. Oh, she doesn't fold your underwear. I also fold... Uh, you, you'll be surprised to know this. I have a very particular way of folding... Oh, shocking. shocking. My clothes. How do you fold your underwear? Uh, it goes in half and then in thirds. Wow. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Demonstrate for us. Do you fold your laundry in any particular way? I do. I fold my laundry in a particular yeah, way. Yeah, and yeah. fits in the drawer. How yeah, the I'm not good fit. at folding. I will say that. I worked at mm, Bloomingdale's for two days once. <laughs> and I learned. <laughs> for two days. I did. And then I, after two days, I was like, I don't like I don't this. ever want a job again. I can't I need to go this find working a, thing. I need to go no. find a doctor to marry. <laughs> Shut up. No. <laughs> it was hard work, actually. But I learned how to fold a shirt. You know? With, did you have one of the like folding trays? Oh my God, you guys, this is so boring. This is the most exciting conversation <laughs> we've had on the show in a while. There's probably a lot of people out there right now that are folding their laundry listening to this. And I go oh in God. half sleeves, then three. Oh my God. Uh, I do <laughs> <laughs> sleeves in like a fifth on each side. Oh, a fifth. Like a little bit. You want to crease... Like um, a little bit with okay. the seams, then in half, then in half. I also, with the kids, I do the roll up method. I, <laughs> I do. I have fucked with the roll up method. Yeah, before. it's a method, dude. Do you even know about it? Can we stop this folding, this fucking laundry shit? How do you fold your socks? Oh my God. I don't <laughs> want to talk about do you folding get, laundry anymore. Do you get rid do you, of a sock if it doesn't have a match? No, I no, always you, hope that they will find. You've got oh, like a hope. corner of the drawer that has the has solo the, ones. Yeah, where do they go? Well, but then you just wait for. <laughs> you do, but a when they never like come, I'm gonna have a panic attack. <laughs> no, but okay. Last, last folding. How do you do your socks? Oh my god! Do you do the roll and then the inside out, so it's in like a little ball? I do. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. You? Oh my god. I do. Do you? This is his favorite conversation <laughs> of all time. 
<laughs> He's come to life. We found I've it. never heard Rob talk more. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it is interesting because i had my friend she does she has a home organizing company and she came over and was helping me put stuff away and the way she did it was very different yeah. than what i do and i was like oh she she like studies this you know you got any um, tips that you learned i want to die <laughs> <laughs> i will tell you Certain things that are such big game changers that I would have never known about are like little things like in the cupboards, like having things on uh, Lazy Susan. Yep. Yeah. Those are a game changer. And then she got, they have these like clear plastic things that go in between sweaters to keep them separated from the other ones. And it's like, whoa, I live, that's like department store level organization. Rachel's reading the books right now. What's so triggering? When was the first time you felt this? Let's go back to that child. How many times do you wear something I before you consider do it dirty? Once. Not jeans, though. Jeans many times. Jeans like weeks. Once on everything else? No, we kind of. It well, depends, depends on what it wearing, is. If you have like an undershirt. That's under an anything? undershirt? What is this, 1950? I'm wearing an undershirt. I'm wearing an undershirt. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you guys so much today. <laughs> so much. I actually wear undershirts. Yeah, are the undershirt always one No, like one a years? shirt. Of course you wear a shirt under your sweater. But the way you're talking, it's like my pop-up <laughs> with like his undershirt that he wore every single day this of his life. This is an undershirt. Yeah, a, this undershirt. What is going on? <laughs> Are you not wearing an undershirt right now? No, I have a shirt on, a top that does not require an undershirt. Shh, it's, shh, it has shh, show open. us what's under it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're go over to YouTube. Rachel's gonna show yeah. us show her us undershirt. What's under that? Uh, okay. okay. Well, what do you want to talk about, Rachel? I yeah, don't. I think you made a list. No, you I'm did. Done. I'm so. We can keep carrying this thing and this show if you need us to. Go ahead. About like hangers? <laughs> That's a great question. I've switched all mine to the same. I like how, color. by the way, time out. You're like this post has to be <laughs> killer. Let's talk like laundry and clothes organization. I mean, our audience is gonna love this. They they get it. I know. My mom listens to a podcast about organizing. Does she really? Things is she it told this me. one? <laughs> I mean, hopefully she'll start listening to this again now that we're adding this content into the mix. Did she stop? No, she just listens to it so much that she's run out. So, Oh, got it. If she's we were out every day, she would listen every She'd day. be into it. Hangers, great question. Uh, Certain sweaters can't go on hangers, right? But do you do all uniform hangers? Like all my hangers are the same color and texture. <laughs> I wish I did, but... Uh, most of the stuff that hangs goes to the bike I would cleaner. rather mm. be in my MRI right now. So I'm not going <laughs> to change all of the hangers. Like, I changed all the hangers. Every time they come from the dry cleaners? I don't do that much dry cleaning. Mm. Because I don't wear that much that goes to the dry cleaning. Are all your hangers <laughs> the same? <laughs> How do, do you get velvet or do you get plastic? I do wood. Oh, you do wood for all your clothes. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> What is happening? <laughs> I want to die. <laughs> but I don't like the velvet hangers. How you the, don't? When you touch it, that feeling. So do you go plastic? I have a variety. What do you buy? I don't know. I haven't bought hangers in a while. Oh, I have to go look. You don't know. It's, yeah, there's a I'm lot of plastic. Half wood, half wire from the dry cleaner. Mm, wire. Mm. Oh, <sighs> guys. Well, this podcast has been fun. We're not she, done. She's quitting. I think we haven't no, even I mean, started. She's quitting. No, I mean this podcast is oh. done. Oh, you're done with this post. Oh, but let me let me tell you something. If I were to be like, what kind of Tupperware do you buy? 
Oh, this bitch would jump at the chance to talk about it. (laughs) It just almost started going. Yeah, that's almost, that's worse. I feel like there's much less to talk about with Tupperware than there is Is folding and (laughs) storing clothes. She's like, storing edible food? I have something to talk about. Okay? Yeah. Tell me if this is normal or like if you guys can relate to this or if this is attributed to anxiety. I don't know. Fame. Yeah, I was about to say it. Fame and riches. (laughs) I'm like hot. Like I'm getting really annoyed. (laughs) It's kind of fun. I know. See, this is my whole life. Okay, my brother, my buttons get pushed so easily and people who know how to do it, they love to do it because I get so fucking right. I don't think I fall in that category though. A thousand percent. (laughs) You are the worst. (laughs) Yeah. Anyways, what I want to say is, if I think of every scenario in my head of like a certain thing, <laughs> then that thing can't happen. And if it's the, the one thing happens that I didn't think of, I'm like, oh, that happened because I didn't already think of it. It's like a like, superstition thing? Yeah. Like, I'm going to take this airplane. Okay. Uh, it could be delayed. It could be canceled. We could get um, derailed and like go have to go to a different land in a different location. Then you have to go to a hotel and then you spend the night. Then you go back and then you take the other plane. Then, or, or, (laughs) anyway, like, think of all the scenarios that could happen. I'm just giving an example of airplane, right? And so if I get on the plane, I'm like, okay, I know all of those can't happen because I already thought those things, right? And then sometimes the one thing that happens is the one thing I didn't think of. This is called OCD. Yeah, I think it's… It is. Yeah. It's OCD. Do you ever think, like… Flight can be on time. I just land there and right. get my bag. Get yeah, no, I think of every. That's just a stupid example, happens, right? Your mind give me is, a give me a real example. Or like we're gonna go to this recently. party and I don't know. I, that would Shia be more, gonna be there. No, is it, it ever party? positive? No, Never. no, ever. It's like okay, we could get a cold because of this, or this pink eye could happen, or the stomach bug, or this, 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 or this. Oh, and so if you're I just think thinking of all, all the things, bad things that could happen, yes, to prevent them from happening. So if I thought of them, they're not going to happen. That's insane. Yeah, that's. I think that's OCD. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you relate at all? Nope. No. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah. I don't. I try not. I don't do that every time. Every I'm time going you leave somewhere. The house. <laughs> No, it's you're in a you're really interesting because <laughs> you really are because there's a level of you that's overthinking, and, a massive and a level, level and that's underthinking <laughs> at the same time. You're overthinking about things that you don't have control over and probably don't need to worry about, right? And then not overthinking about things that are in your control <laughs> that right N- require attention. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's just the truth. Oh, man. Yeah. No, but it's very common. Like, look, there's so many times I have this conversation where I'm like, all right, let's change it. Most people play the negative what if game, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so it takes like a concerted effort to be like, all right, let's flip that around and play the positive what if game. What if we get there and the plane's on time? And what if we land early? And what if it, like most humans would have to make a lot of effort to think like that. Mm -hmm. But you're just like self sabotaging too. But it's it's also the superstition in it, which is weird because you're the one who always says, like, your mom is like anti superstition. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember I I'm not like it with yeah. like classic superstitious stuff. <laughs> I make I up get, my own brand. <laughs> I can relate to the superstitious part. Like there's things like you'll walk under a ladder and you're like, whatever. No. No. Yeah, I don't care about that. But if it's like I never. I want something <laughs> good to happen. I have to pretend like it's not gonna happen until it happens. Otherwise, okay. if I get like excited about it or my hopes up about it, that to me, like, okay, that's not gonna happen anymore. Hmm. If I go like talk about it or anything like that. But what about the what about the positive visualization and manifestation? I can still do that, like in, that I can still do that internally and you just like don't plan say for it. it, but I'm not gonna go like show outward excitement for it because then it just doesn't happen. 
Do you ever show outward excitement for things that do In happen? ever? <laughs> no, superstition. Mm. Are you afraid that like if you, you know, I think that most people too are always bracing themselves for disappointment. Yeah. Which is so sad. I do it all the time yeah. in different ways. It's like, I do that a lot with Shepherd, where I'm like preparing myself to hear the worst information all the time so that when I do get a little bit of good information, I'm like shocked or surprised mm. because I've planned to hear all the bad things so that I can prepare myself for what I'm going to hear. So I feel like it, in that sense, I do that. Well, mm-hmm. But there's no superstition But it with softens it. if it doesn't happen. Like you don't, you minimize disappointment. Yeah, but do you? Because you're yeah. still going to feel disappointed. So no, and then I when think- it happens, I'm like, more elated about it because it was know. something I wasn't expecting. Yeah, but I feel like when you prepare yourself to be, let's say, disappointed, like, I'm not going to hear back on that thing. It's fine. And you do the whole disappointment thing. And then you end up not hearing back. So then you got disappointed twice. I think it's I think it's you know evolved I mean? mm-hmm. into less that and more like, me obsessing over this isn't going to change whether it happens or not. Yeah. So I'm just going to leave it there, continue as if this isn't a thing, and then if it happens, great, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. Is that how you felt when you first met us? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was it nine I, months it took for you to start the show. I used to have to do that when nine I was months. dating. Do you? It took about nine Did months. Did you? What? Ever have to do that dating? It's like you get excited Wait. and you're like, don't get excited. Like this doesn't mean this is your person. And you have yeah, to like, like let it happen. Brace yourself. No, see, it's the opposite for me when it comes to men. What do you mean? I'm totally joking. They oh, just, I was they like, just all come to her and <laughs> no, disappoint not. I'm just making a joke. Um, No, I think it's always… <sighs> I don't know. I'm trying to think of other ways where it shows up, you know? And if it's like catastrophizing. So you're getting an MRI today. Oh, I'm fine. It's her foot. It's my foot. Even though I've done a full body, like my brain, like all that, and I was still fine. I'm, I am weird. She's so weird. <laughs> this is, right? Yeah. Do you see what I mean by you being weird? And I'm weird? not scared of flying at all. That's not why I think of all these things. It's more of like the inconvenience of like, am I not going to get home? Or are we not going to be able to? Yeah. It has nothing to do with like being scared to fly. You're more concerned about, are we going to be back Saturday so Briar can go to yeah. so-and-so's birthday? Yeah, literally. And if we don't, yeah. then, yeah. Mm-hmm. Then it's the end of the world if she misses No, but I, party. you know. No, but she, that's like what drives her thinking. Yeah, yeah. it's my kid. Mm-hmm. Always. It's true. And that's why I'll be like, oh, if this, ha-, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but nothing about me. Like, I, you know. Well, you're putting a lot of weight on like things always being perfect for her, which I think grades on you of like no but I I do the thing too where if she's going to be disappointed you know we talk about it and it's like I understand if you feel this way but it's also life you know it's that thing that about uh preparing them for like the weather yes can you not explain shielding, that? shielding them from the weather like giving them the rain coat the rain boots the- and the rain coat and then like they have to experience it instead of just you know blocking the weather from them giving them the skills and the tools. And I'm a big believer in that. But so I, it's not like I'm But you are following her with or, an umbrella and being like, here. You might but she it. has never felt a raindrop. <laughs> exactly. No, but I think it's important, you know. But I do, her Just happiness. her to a state where it doesn't rain. <laughs> her happiness and all of that, it all comes first. I never come first. How do you feel about happiness? You got it, you should date, Yeah. <laughs> I was talking to a friend last night. We were driving. I was like, so-and-so was saying that they're not happy doing this or they're not happy doing that. And she goes, happy? Who's happy? <laughs> and then she's like, it's not a time to be happy. <laughs> and it was just so funny and fun to hear. And I personally think people put too much attention on happiness. And it's just one feeling you feel in a day. Yeah, your goal shouldn't, to, shouldn't be to be happy all the time. Yeah, I agree. I think it's an unrealistic right. crop yeah. shite. It's definitely unrealistic. And that's boring if you're just happy all the time. 
Have you tried it? I've been super grumpy oh, lately. I'm aware. <laughs> Crunch wrap supreme. Crunchy. Crunch, my brother. Crunch wrap supreme. I'm crunchy. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But I talk about it. Thank God you don't take it out on me. I don't take it out on anybody. Mm. To their mm. face. Mm. I'm just kidding. Well. <laughs> I, I really don't. Mm. Well. Who? Sometimes you and I are very similar and we can take it out on, on our moms. moms. I haven't done me. that. On Rob. Yeah. Sure. It's very easy. Mm-hmm. I don't, but no, I don't take it out on you. Mm. I don't. Mm. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I do not. So that is another thing. I think that your mom, my mom, I want to know who's yours. So yeah. Jeff who's your always, low hanging fruit. Well, no, it's like the way Jeff says it is like he's like, you're my landing, you're my lightning landing. Like lightning needs to place to land. So if he's stressed, if he's wherever, I'm where it lands, right? We all have that in our life. It's like, who's your landing? Where does it come out for you? Probably Natalie. Do you not take it out on her? No, I... I think I try not to, like, show too much stress or emotion. (laughs) Shocking. Why? It's it's not been a, it's not helpful. Like m- me being t- visibly stressed isn't going to make me less stressed. I'll go ride the Peloton for an hour instead. Or do you collect resentments though if you don't express your emotions and your feelings? No, if I need if it's going to be a resentment, I can express it. But I feel like I have a decent handle on managing my emotions and stress. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Who's your landing? It's your mom, mom. right? Mm. <laughs> Is it anyone else? Me. Leah. Sometimes Leah. Sometimes Leah. Oh, poor, poor Leah. Leah. Not really, though. No, but yeah, I know like, what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. You too. Leah? No. <laughs> I. I don't think so. Deanna. Oh, Deanna. Deanna. There's certain people people that you feel like the safest, like, I don't know what it is. It's not about safe, but like they get the like, you know. The brunt. My brother. One thousand percent. percent Is my landing. He's for me too. And so is my dog sometimes. Well, strawberries. Is like kicking her? No. I've never kicked her. Yell at her? No, it's just internally where it's like I'll be annoyed about something Fuck else. This and talk. then, yeah, and, and I'll walk strawberry. by her and just be like, strawberry. And then it's like, she's not doing anything. She's sleeping. <laughs> she's just like laying there. Oh. You suck. No, I'm just kidding. Huh. All right. That's enough of me. <laughs> I can't believe you guys never think about the scenarios, though. It's interesting to me. It's interesting to us that you do. Correct. I think. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I wonder how many people listening can relate. Like, there's zero. (laughs) It's like no one's ever done it once. (laughs) You make, like, a map of all the different outcomes? I don't do it a lot or often, I want to say. Is it just when you're stressed? But I did think something happened the other day, and I thought, oh, my God, I just did that thing, and I don't do it a lot, but that's something to talk about because I'm curious what other people do. Got a question to answer. Oh, let's do it. Um, I don't fully understand this one, so we'll we'll get through it together. Oh, boy. Joy. I am a 24-year-old female. My mother-in-law won't let me go because I'm pregnant with my deceased boyfriend, baby. Won't let her go where? We'll see. How do I get her to let me go? Oh. Won't let me go. I was with my boyfriend for three years. He introduced me to Mill and Phil. I'm going to assume that's mother-in-law, father-in-law, but it's a boyfriend, so... And we got on fine. I grew really close to them. Me and my boyfriend, 24, moved in together. He was the sweetest, most loving person I ever, and I miss him every day. He passed away in an accident eight months ago. Mm. He proposed to me a week before the accident. Mm-mm. I didn't know I was pregnant at the time. I only found out weeks later after he had passed on. Um, wow. I was excited and scared. He was meant to be here with me and our son, and I told my in-laws, and they were happy. My mother-in-law especially. 
She was there for all my baby appointments, and I'm very grateful she's been a big support. But then my parents called to check up on me, and I missed them so much, and I got homesick. So I flew back home to my home country to be with my parents, and I just didn't want to go back. I decided I want to stay in my home country. So I flew back and decided to tell my in-laws in person that I've decided to move back home for good. My father-in-law was quiet. My mother-in-law started crying and telling me I can't do this, that I'm taking a part of her son away from her. I told her I will come back and visit, and they are more than welcome to come visit me anytime. She got really upset, and after all we did for you, this is how you're going to treat us and take away our only grandson. I was shocked and started crying and telling her I was grateful for what they did for me. Father-in-law had to take her out of the room. He came back and apologized and said, let her get used to the idea. I left and came back to my apartment. My mother-in-law left a long voicemail telling me I'm selfish if I do this and I can't do this to them. I tried ringing her back, but she won't take my calls. I'm feeling really guilty and starting to feel depressed. I want to go home, but I don't want to keep hurting my in-laws. How do I get them to let me go without hurting her further? Well, that's a grieving mother you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So that clearly is, you know, she's going to go to her home country and eventually, like, time, going to have to get used to it, visit back and forth. It's not going to be ideal for the mother-in-law. And that's so sad because, like, her son passed and Mm -hmm. that's his son. Mm -hmm. But that's a grieving mother, so of course she's going to react like that. Mm -hmm. But I think she needs to do what's best for her and the baby. Yeah, her and the baby. Right? Yeah, of course. She's got to go home. And if it's going to be helpful for her and she's going to get the support, she needs to go home. Yeah. But, like… She needs to… I mean, she needs to give the mother-in-law some space and some time with it. And assure her that, like, she can still be part of the baby's life. Right. But in this capacity. Yeah. I mean, she's going to have to accept that the woman's not going to be happy about it because it's the only thing she has left of her son, I'm sure. And, you know, Mm -hmm. it's a shitty situation. It's really a shitty situation. It's It's awful. Very sad. But, like, there's no making— That's the thing is that you got to just like kind of allow people to feel the way they feel. And like you said, hold space, give it time, let it pass. Mm -hmm. And go home to your country. Go home. I think we did that. I think I'm going to go home now. (laughs) I think we all go home. Especially you. I'm home. (laughs) I'm going to go get my MRI, guys. I know everyone's been anticipating the results for my foot. They can't wait. They can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> they can't wait to hear about your next laundry adventures. Mm. Yeah, I post in the comments. Um, yeah, we'll show you. How you like pictures. to fold shirts, underwear, socks. Let's prove Rachel wrong. <laughs> people have a, preferences. Yeah, that people want to know. know. Of course they have preferences. The people I have preferences. This. I'd like to know if you use like laundry detergent that still smells really no. good or if you do all the like clean and free of all the things. I don't like the smell of perfumed. Lo- well, that's not oh true. Oh my God, I love I know you love Tide. You Tide, love the smell of Tide. But I can't Tide. use it because of all the... We do I the, use like, Tide free. We've got the washer like sheet things. The sheets, do you like them? Yeah. They- yeah. See, but if somebody washes in a certain detergent, it's like the smell thing again, and then you want to like. Yeah, if it's too strong, you don't want all your clothes to be smelling like laundry detergent. That used to be my favorite thing in the world, and I had to let it go. I liked Downy. Oh, Mm. yeah. I used to like really like it when I had a crush on a guy in like high school. Yeah, and they had a smell to their and detergent. They had a smell to their detergent. It's like the deodorant thing. I and it made me feel smells. like they were loved. Oh. Like someone washed their shirts. Oh. You know? The crisp white t shirt. Yeah, they like someone loved them. <laughs> now nobody's loved. I smell them. I'm like, nobody loves you. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. All right, I gotta go. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye.